All right, I'm going to be answering a comment that appeared on in, down in the comment section of the last video that I did on Peter being history's worst pope. Of course, that was said in jest. Peter was never a pope. I proved that from Scripture, which uh, the Catholics can't handle, of course. But here's the comment. I'm going to put it up on screen. It says, uh, Miles Natalie, or however you say the name there, um, this is absolute, or seriously, the absolute worst attempt at a refutation of the Catholic Church's teaching on the pope. Husky, please, please, please debate me publicly on this. I would love all of your minions to see you absolutely slaughtered in an actual scholarly debate. Okay. Uh, you ought to check maybe Romans chapter 1 sometime and uh, see what the Bible says about debate. But uh, we won't get into that. I do actually have a study on the thing about debate. But uh, oh, here's what I said back. Let me ask you just one question. Can you prove that Peter was the first pope from the Bible alone? In other words, no traditions, historical citations, or church father quotations. Of course, they can't. Proven here in his reply back to me. It says back here, Hus Husky, I can definitely set the foundation for Peter being the chief apostle. Okay, I just, you know, I, which I refuted in the whole study. It's ridiculous. And logic would follow since he was the leader of the church in Rome at the end of his life that he was indeed the first pope. After all, what is the pope? The bishop of the church in Rome. Without a shadow of a doubt, I can prove this from the Bible and the Bible alone. But I'll ask you a question. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second there. Um, see, here's how the thing works. You said that you can prove it from the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, that shouldn't take very long. All you got to do is just simply give me a scripture quotation. Just give me some place where it says that Peter was in Rome or that Peter was recognized as the bishop of Rome or anything. I mean, I proved conclusively that Paul was in Rome, but Peter was never in Rome, according to scripture. See, Catholics are liars. But now see how they do this. They, he can't answer the question. And so he, what he does is he says, well, let me ask you a question. Well, uh, don't we get to play fair here? You know, don't you, you know, shouldn't you ask, answer my question first? You know, you say, oh, I can answer your question, but let me ask you one. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, why would I debate a liar like you? Kind of odd. But uh, here's the question, and this is what this study is going to be about. Here's the question. It says, where does the Bible ever say that everything must be found in the Bible? I'll wait. Well, Hope I didn't keep you waiting too long because I have other things to do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let's look about that. And of course, one of the big things that these papists get all excited about is Revelation chapter 22, which I ended the study with. So why don't we go to Revelation 22? There's a warning about adding to or subtract subtracting from the scriptures. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now the papists come along and they go, see, it's, when it says this book or the book, it's just meaning revelation. You can mess with all other 65 other books of the Bible, but just leave revelation alone. Of course, if you're a Catholic, you have apocryphal books that were added after the completion of the New Testament. Oh, no, they, they had the Greek Septuagint B.C. No, they did not. There's never been any proof of that. The whole thing is just a, the, the mythological Septuagint, okay, the, the whole thing is just a lie, you know, another Catholic lie. But they have more books that they added too. you know, Bell and the Dragon, Mac Maccabees, and all this other ridiculous nonsense. But the point is, the Catholics will say that Oh, you know, this warning here is only for the book of Revelation. And yet it's very interesting, you see, because the most sacred manuscript in the possession of the Vatican is a codex known as B, designation B, also known as the Vaticanus or Vaticanus or however you want to say the stupid thing. It's toilet paper, actually, is what it is. Um, completely useless manuscript. And you know what the interesting thing is? The Vaticanus manuscript removes the entire book of Revelation. Isn't that weird? So the Catholics come out and they say, 
Well, this warning about adding to or taking or you know adding to or subtracting from Scripture, that's only for the book of Revelation. And then they'll turn right around and they use the Vaticanus manuscript, which removes the entire book of Revelation. We got the thinkers there, don't we? <laughs> Come on. But let's just go with this little theory here for a minute. If this warning is only for the book of Revelation, then there shouldn't be any other warnings in the Bible about adding to or subtracting from Scripture. Right? I mean, now, you know, I'll just say this, you know, I'm going to spoil the surprise a little bit because there are many other warnings against adding to or subtracting from Scripture. They're all through the Bible. We're going to look at them in this study. And I'm going to show you the Scriptures, too, that talk about being judged by the written Word and that the written Word uh, is our only standard. I'm going to show it to you. Um, but just, just think about this for a minute. When you are held to a standard, you know, he talks about logic and stuff like this in his question. Well, logic would dictate. Well, let's, let's think logically here for a minute. Um, what would be a better system where I can just simply come out in my own whim and say, you know what, I'm actually supposed to have everybody send me a million dollars this week. God told me to say that. See, a Bible believer would say, wait a second, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, a Bible believer judges things according to Scripture. We have a written standard. I am held accountable to the book. You see? But you say, well, that, of course, that'd be ridiculous. How is it any more ridiculous than what the Pope does? The Pope comes out and says, I'm going to sit here on this little chair with an upside-down cross on it, and I'm going to say, this is an ex-cathedra statement. You do your little bow thing there, you know, like the Antichrist is going to do one day, because he's going to be a pope. But you come out and you say, this is an ex-cathedra statement. And people say, wait a second there, uh, Holy Father, you know, which again is God's title. doesn't bother these Satanists called popes, but they come out and they say, um, I'm going to make this statement, and somebody says, wait a second there, Pope, um, what you said just contradicts Scripture. An official Catholic doctrine says if the Pope's word contradicts the Word of God, you know, sacred Scripture, then you go with the Pope. Tell me I'm wrong, Roman Catholics. Tell me I'm wrong. And the Popes are getting so wicked as Francis and, and Benedict and things too and John Paul II. Those guys were so liberal and so ecumenical and wicked. You're having to go back to be pre-Vatican II Catholics, aren't you? Because the modern Catholic system is so evil and so corrupt that even Roman Catholics themselves look into it and they go, it's just so bad. It, it, you know, the Popes are contradicting former Catholic teachings. It's a problem, isn't it? I mean, if you have an unbroken line of succession down from Peter, who got it from Jesus, uh, why are they contradicting themselves the whole way through the thing? And, of course, you know, making a mockery out of the, the Bible. It's a problem, isn't it? It's a big problem. You just have to kind of pretend that that's not there, you know. That God just keeps revealing things through the, the popes and stuff like this, and we're, we're headed for, you know, good times. Sure. Right. You see, now it's far more logical. If you want to talk logic, logic would dictate if there is a God, okay, of course there is, I'm just speaking here, let's just look at this thing logically. If there is a God and he writes something in a book, that book would be authoritative. And not some man coming out and saying, hey, I want to be this and I want to be that. And people say, that's not what the Bible says. This book claims to be God's word. This book here says one thing and what you're saying contradicts it. Well, logic would say then the guy that's contradicting it is wrong and in error. So you want to talk logic, logic lines up with Bible-believing Christianity. I am held to a standard, and I'm holding it right here. And you out there, other Bible-believing Christians, you're holding it. And you know, it's funny too, because even the Roman Catholic Bible versions, the, you know, I have one, see I have one right here, I'm doing some, I'm going to be doing another study. This is what really irks the Catholics, you see, because I'm not just some kind of a uh, foaming-at-the-mouth, backwoods, hillbilly preacher that doesn't know anything. Uh, I actually have your sources. Um, in my library, I have more sources than a lot of Catholics do. 
I know your system. Okay? But here we have the New American Bible. And you know what the funny thing is? Even as corrupt and, and ridiculous as this thing is, it's an Egyptian Bible. This is a Syrian Bible. If you want to talk about the New Testament Greek text. This thing, even as corrupt as it is, it still is against Roman Catholicism. Even this thing, I could, pr I could preach a sermon right out of this thing and disprove every point of Roman Catholicism, including this teaching that Peter was the Bishop of Rome. I can prove it wrong from this one and from any other corrupted Bible version out there that comes from the Vatican. So you have to get rid of the Bible as the final authority. That's the whole point. But now let's look at some other warnings in Scripture against adding to or subtracting from the words of God. Let's look about this. Proverbs chapter 30. What's really going on in Revelation, the warnings there about adding to or subtracting from Scripture, yes, that's true for the book of Revelation, but those warnings are all through Scripture. We're going to look at those, and uh, they apply to the whole Bible. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Let's read this. You want to mark these down if you're a Bible-believing Christian. Mark these verses down so that when you get run into a papist that says, Oh, well, adding to Scripture. You know, we add our traditions, but that's, you know, we're not adding things to Revelation somehow, even though their greatest manuscript takes the whole book out. I don't know how you can figure that one out if you're a Catholic. But uh, write these Scriptures down. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We're going to see about this theme of people that add are liars. We're going to see about that. Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah chapter 26. You might have to wear a dust mask if you're a Catholic because, you know, there's probably so much dust on your you know, Bible there, when you're flipping through it, it's probably just blowing dust everywhere. You know, don't want to inhale that. That might be dangerous. Catholics don't read their Bibles very much is what I'm trying to say in my loving way. Proverbs chapter, or excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 2 through 6. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil, which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, if ye will not hearken to me, to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth." Don't mess with God's Word. And by the way, um, there's only seven references in King James Bible to the capital W Word of God, the manifest Word, which is Jesus Christ, one of His titles. Whenever you're reading lowercase w, it's either spoken or written. Every single reference. So don't give me this thing of, well, the, the perfect Word of God is actually a reference to Jesus Christ. Uh, well, that depends on which scripture you're talking about here. But this one here is talking about written word. You're not to diminish anything from it. And if you do, God sends a curse upon your city, upon your nation. Why do you think America has had so many problems since these new Vatican versions have come in in the late 1800s? Actually, if you want to be honest, it's 1800s, late 1800s was over in the UK with the revised version of Westcott and Hort, which I have a copy um, here in my collection. 1881 New Testament. I've showed it in video. Again, I have the proof. In America, it was 1901 that the American Standard Version came out. Both of them rely heavily on the Vaticanus text that I talked about, and Sinaiticus as well. That's why they'll talk about two oldest and best manuscripts. You'll hear that over and over and over again. All right. There's a whole lot more I could say on that. But let's continue. I'll show you a couple more scriptures here. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. So I guess with, the, with this uh, philosophy that the Catholics have, you know, 
where uh, the warnings in Revelation about adding to or subtracting from the Word of God, that's only for the book of Revelation. Well, then I guess the one in Proverbs 30, verses 5 through 6, was only for the book of Proverbs. And then the one here in Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 2 through 6, was probably only for the book of Jeremiah. So, <laughs> no, it's logic dictates when God says, here is my word, you don't mess with it. All right? You don't, you know, change it and add to and subtract from. Which the Catholics have been doing for centuries. Why? Well, because it crosses their peculiar doctrines. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Is that really hard to understand? I mean, is this really something that's really a deep teaching of Scripture? No, it's not. You can just look at the Bible and you can say, well, I mean, it ends with the book of Revelation. It begins to Genesis, in Genesis, goes to Revelation. We really don't need anything else than that. It tells us what the future is going to be. Which includes, you know, Revelation 17 and 18 includes the destruction of, of Roman Catholicism, which is identified as Mystery Babylon. So another good reason to take it out, you know, take the whole book of Revelation out of your Greek manuscript there. But uh, another story. Next, let's go to Psalm 107. You know, to the Catholic that wrote the comment, you know, can you give me some scripture proving that scripture alone is to be the final authority? Well, uh, hope you're paying attention. You know, and I just, I just want you to understand, my sarcasm is uh, based up in love. You might not think that. You might think, how's that possible? Well, if you, you know, read through the Bible, God is very sarcastic, right? The Lord is very sarcastic. His preachers are going to be sarcastic, okay? There's going to be some sarcasm in there. Your system is ridiculous. Do you understand that? Right? I'm not going to respect a system with a guy that walks around in pajamas with a little thing on his head and little slippers and people come and they kiss his ring and, and he sits up on little thrones and stuff like this and a bunch of other guys dressed in other collared pajamas, you know, and, and multi-billion dollar uh, big huge temples and things like this with statues of people that weren't even in Rome, you know, Egyptian obelisks out in the middle, the you know, Eightfold Path of Enlightenment, you know, and that's St. Peter's Basilica and things like this, and all this other weird occultism stuff, and they're raping children, and they're being shipped to here and shipped to there, and they're controlling politics, and what. And I'm supposed to respect that? I mean, my desire for you as a Roman Catholic is for you to get saved and have a personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Do you understand that? See, I have understood, I, I've talked to Catholics for many, many, many years, and Catholics are under heavy mind control. And I've seen the only way that you can really shake them out, most of them, is to smack them hard. You know, it's like they're in a very, very deep sleep, and you go, you go like this, and you kind of shake them a little bit, you just kind of gently, you know, and they're, they just keep snoring, and you go, hey, 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 wake up. And you have to go, Hey, wake up. That's what I'm doing. I'm smacking you in love. <laughs> Let's continue. Psalm 107, verse 11 and 12. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Babylon, Babylon is fallen. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Next, let's go to Jeremiah 23. Back to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning in verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith... They take away the words and then they say, God is saying, God is speaking to you today. What is that? Catholic priests, the Catholic magisterium, <laughs> you know, the hierarchy. That's what they do. They take the words of God away from people, which literally they did. I mean, it's kind of funny. It's been brought up before. 
uh, a brother in the Lord said this as a comment, which is phenomenal. You know, they, oh, Catholics, we gave the world the Bible. Well, if that's true, then why did you take it away from people? Why'd you burn people at the stake for translating it into their own tongue? Isn't that weird? You know, all through the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church just said only the priesthood, only the priest class will have the scriptures in Latin, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And we'll have it up there, you know, chained to the pulpit or something, and only the priest can read it and understand. If you gave the world the Bible, why'd you take it from them? Kind of weird. Well, probably because you were uh, stealing the words of God and then saying, He saith. Isn't that something? Verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Let me ask you a question, Roman Catholics out there. What profit is there in being a Catholic? You know, we have a song as Bible-believing Christians. It says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. <clears throat> Don't have the best voice. Sorry. <laughs> Do you have that? Do you have a blessed assurance? You say, well, of course we have the, the, the one true church. No, 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 no. I'm talking doctrinally. Can you go up to your Catholic priest and say, hey, Father, you know, you shouldn't be calling men in on earth your father like that in as far as a religious title. Can you go up to him and say, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. I have a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Can you say that? I know what your catechism teaches. That's the sin of presumption, isn't it? You can't say that. You can't come up and say, Jesus died on the cross for it to pay for my sins. His righteousness is imputed to me. I don't have to worry about going to purgatory or any other kind of an intermediate state. I'm going right to heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You can't say that. That's heresy according to a Catholic. Hmm. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. I'll get Catholic sometimes, you know, you're, you're going to have, you, you need to leave your heretical system and come and join the, you know, rejoin the mother church or something like this. Why? What do you have to offer me? No assurance of my salvation. I have to die in a state of grace. I have to give uh, special things to the, uh, my local church, you know, lots and lots of money. You have nothing to offer me. Interesting. Jump down to verse uh, 36 of the same chapter there, Jeremiah chapter 23. And the burden of the, of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. Roman Catholicism has been busy perverting the words of the living God from the very beginning. They want to tell you, oh, we were the ones that gave the world the Bible. We gave, we, you know, we, you know, had our councils and we, we determined what is the, in the canon of Scripture. And we, if if it wasn't for the Catholic Church, you wouldn't have the Bible. That is nonsense. Okay, there were many ancient Bible versions held by ancient Christians that were going around, you know, groups and stuff. There, there was many groups, you know, and I'm not saying that they were all 100% correct in every doctrine that they had. The Paulicians, the Donatists, the Waldensians. The Vaudois, the there was the Huguenots, a lot of those old groups, and I realize some of them came about later on, but there were many, many groups of Bible-believing Christians that had the Bible, that had the canon figured out long before the Catholic Church ever came around. All right, I mean, where was Christianity for the first three centuries? All the Church Fathers and stuff like this. I mean, you read the Church Fathers; those guys were heretics. And again, the teachings of the church fathers oftentimes contradict the teachings of the modern popes. And you know it's true. You know I'm telling you the truth. If you're a Catholic and you understand your whole system, you know that the popes of today contradicts the church fathers of yesterday. And they contradict the Bible, the sacred scriptures. 
I mean, the Pope has recently come out and said that sodomites should be just, we should welcome them and things, and atheists have their own way to heaven, and Muslims, and he's bringing in all these other stuff. But the Catechism says only Roman Catholics go to heaven. You must be connected to the church to go to heaven. What's the Pope doing bringing in all these other false systems? Did Peter do that? Answer that. Answer it. Don't bother going to your councils and your little teachings and doctrines of men and stuff like that. Answer it from Scripture. Show me that there's another way but through Jesus Christ. You can't. John chapter 8, verse 47. John 8, 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Yeah. That's why the scriptures don't make sense to Roman Catholics. That's why they have to overthrow it and say, well, we, we believe in the sacred scriptures, but if our divine traditions are, say something different, then we go with our divine traditions. You don't hear God's words because you're not of God. You're of your father, the devil. John chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Did you get that? Um, what's the standard? I mean, can you show from the Bible that we're supposed to be judged that only the Bible should be our standard? Oh, well, I'd say that's a pretty good verse right there, John 12, 48. I'd say that's a real good verse. What is going to be the standard that judges us in the last day? Church councils? I mean, how many things has the Pope just come out with just in recent years? I mean, two of the big uh, doctrinal stands of the Catholic Church, the Immaculate Conception and, and the Assumption of Mary, are... I mean, the Immaculate Conception is over 100 years old, but it was, you know, late 1800s. The Assumption of Mary, I think, was in the 1950s. What they believe for 1900 years. And again, you know, oh, well, you know, Mary, she was immaculately conceived. She was, she was born without the stain of original sin. Um, and so, therefore, she couldn't have died. So, well, we've got to fix that up. So uh, she was taken, caught up bodily into heaven, the Assumption of Mary. Okay, um, where's that at in Scripture? Oh, well, it's not in sacred Scripture, but, you know, the point is um, it, it's in divine tradition because our, our theologians and the Pope officially, you know, made it ex cathedra, so we're, we're, we, it's there. <laughs> You're not Christians. Do you understand? Roman Catholics are not Christians. Let's continue. Proverbs 13, verse 13. This is an interesting verse. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Now, let me ask you a question. Bible-believing Christians versus Roman Catholicism. Um, it, who would hate the word? Who would despise the word out of the two groups? Those of us that uh, hold this book in very high regard, we say it's the greatest book ever written. As an English-speaking Christian, I say the King James Bible is the greatest book ever written. It is the uh, king of books. And that's a scientifically verifiable fact, too, by the way. That's not my opinion. Uh, you, can, you can disagree with the contents of the King James Bible, but the fact of the matter is this King James Bible is the greatest book ever written. No other book has been able to publish as many copies as this King James Bible. No other book has been able to go into so many different lands as this King James Bible. This is the greatest book in history. Documented fact. It's not my opinion. Again, I've showed the proof of that in other studies. You can see there's other studies. 
Now, would we be accused of despising the word? Or how about the Roman Catholicism that sought to change this book and uh, reveres Codex B, which removes the entire book of Revelation after being told in Revelation not to add to or subtract from the word of God? Kind of an issue. Matthew chapter 15, if you want a good verse that really talks about Roman Catholicism, not by name because the word Roman Catholicism does not appear anywhere in the King James Bible. They say, oh, well, um, you know, they were they called themselves Catholic and, the, you know, there and they just didn't really write it in there. Uh, well, actually, the word Catholic, you know, universal there um, means, you know, it actually came from Greek philosophers before the New Testament was even written. So don't say, oh, they came up with a term later on and stuff and for the church. Uh, no, it's just, you know, Greek philosophy. Again, you know, you have the, the two centers there, Antioch in Syria, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, where they were first called Christians, disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, and all these missionary movements going out from Antioch in Syria, and yet over in Alexandria, Egypt, you have philosophers coming to persecute Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and put him to death. And... There's not a whole lot of good coming out of Egypt. And yet the manuscripts that the Catholic Church uses trace back to Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt, where there was a school of philosophy where they were blending Greek pagan mythology, Greek pagan ph philosophical terms, Gnosticism and things, blending it with certain aspects of Scripture. But there were certain things in the Bible that they didn't really like. So they just kind of rewrote certain parts of Scripture. And they're perverting the words of God. Adding to, subtracting from. And so it is today. But if you want to see a really, really good uh, set of scriptures that perfectly defines what Roman Catholicism does, here we go. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You mean they were adding their own man-made traditions to God's commandments? Yep. The ancient Pharisees back in the first century are exemplified today by modern Roman Catholics. You elevate your traditions above Scripture. According to your own standards. Again, oh, wow, wow this is, I can't believe you say, am I wrong? I have the catechisms. I put out a video recently, a little bit ago, that Catholics are not Bible-believing Christians. One of your great philosophers, this Ph.D. Catholic, and he says, uh, Roman Catholics do not hold the Bible as the sole authority. I'm not slandering, I'm not attacking, I'm not whatever, I'm stating facts. And you know I'm right if you're a Roman Catholic. Verse 4, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It's Roman Catholicism. It's exactly what it is. I'll give you a good example. To be saved, you have to take the Mass. Perpetually. Not once and done. You have to come and you have to pay, partake in the Eucharistic ceremony. You say, what is it? Well, you have to come and, you have, of course, you have to be a confirmed Catholic to do this. You can't just, I couldn't walk in there. I'm a heretic. I'd have to join the Catholic Church, which isn't going to happen. But I come in there, or, oh, that's right, I'm a heretic, sorry. Um, Catholic comes in there and they take the Mass, Okay. And you're, a lot of times you're supposed to do the auricular confession, of course, before you do that whole thing. But again, um, you go in, you take the Mass, and what are you supposed to believe? That the priest, after he does the 
Latin thing there, the, you know, whatever. Um, he changes the bread into the flesh of Jesus. You know, um, the flesh. And the wine, he changes into the blood. The blood. And then you partake of the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And they pervert scripture. They go where Jesus was talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And yet they don't, it never occurs, um, Jesus is actually saying that and he's physically present. And nobody comes up to him and eats his flesh and drinks his blood. Weird, isn't it? I mean, if Jesus is speaking literally, why didn't anybody eat him? And why is it that he said, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing? Hmm. So what the Catholic does is they say, well, yes, um, but you see, and they'll get into all this other stuff. And of course, there's also three different commands in Scripture not to drink flesh, or not to drink blood, excuse me, not to eat flesh, you know, raw flesh with the blood. You're not to eat blood or drink blood like that, raw, you know, meat and blood. You're not to do that. Three different places in Scripture. Let me give you that, by the way, real quickly, because I'm probably some of you are going, what? I never heard that. Well, I'll give it to you. Acts chapter 15 is one of the ones. I'll give you the other two references because I have them written here on the side. Um, okay, Genesis 9 verse 4, Leviticus 17 verse 14, and Acts chapter 15 verse 29, which says that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well, fare ye well. So the council at Jerusalem there and they're saying, don't drink blood. You just stay away from blood. Well, how does that work if you're supposed to go and say that the wine becomes literal blood? You see what happens? You make the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. The Eucharistic ceremony overthrows Scripture, thereby proving that you're a Pharisee and lost and on your way to hell. That's what's going on there. Next, let's go to Acts chapter 19. Show you a couple more scriptures here on the thing of this, the Bible being the final authority. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 20. I thought this was kind of an interesting little story to prove my point. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? It's kind of funny. It's like, you know, the, the Catholic, modern Catholic system is like, we're, we're built upon the you know foundation of Jesus and we respect the Apostle Paul and Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. And it's like, and yet they're doing all kinds of evil, wicked stuff. Kind of like the devils would be going, you know, I know Jesus, I know Paul, I know Peter, but who are you? Verse 16, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Remember that point. The name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Wait a second. I thought it said up there in verse 17, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Down here it says, mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You see, how this system works is, when you bring glory to Jesus Christ, it's got to be because of this book. You see, people will say to you, well, you can know Jesus apart from the Bible. Don't be so tied to the Bible. Uh, let me tell you something right now. You wouldn't know Jesus Christ if it wasn't for this book. You wouldn't be saved if it wasn't for this book. Anybody could come along and tell you anything. That's why people were so deceived for centuries 
during the Dark Ages. Why? They didn't have the Bible. That's why Roman Catholicism has feared one thing more than anything else, and that is for the people to have the Word of God in their own language where they can understand it. Because anybody can read this book and look at Catholicism and go, wait a second, Roman Catholicism is not what's going on in here. That's why more and more Christians are also waking up to the Protestant system, which is repackaged Roman Catholicism. They, they tried to reform Roman Catholicism. They protested abuses of Roman Catholicism, rightly so, but then they just tried to reform it and say, we'll come out with our own system of Catholicism. That's why I'm not a Protestant. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Big difference there. You see, because the Protestants do things that don't appear in here either. And you know, I personally have done things that didn't appear in this book in the past. I preached in church buildings. I wore the suit and tie thing. I went and had the altar call and all this other stuff. And you go, wait a second. You know, you start to read the Bible and you go, this isn't in here. Then you change. You see? Don't make the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. Don't overthrow the scriptures because of what you've always done. We always have done this. Uh-uh. The Bible is our standard. We're not to add to or subtract to any part of it. Not just the book of Revelation or Proverbs or Jeremiah or Deuteronomy. It's the whole Bible that you're not supposed to add to. Now we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. to it here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God lowercase w again which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Again Roman Catholicism has nothing to offer me or any other Bible-believing Christian. A bunch of dead pagan rituals. It go goes back to ancient Babylon. That all, that's all you have to offer me? That's, that's all that you have over me? It's ridiculous. Okay? Why does the system of Bible-believing Christianity work? Because we believe the standard that we hold. Do you understand that? Okay, that's the difference between me and you as a Roman Catholic or a Protestant. The difference between us is I believe the book I hold. I don't say, well, actually, you know, I'll take my uh, Texas Receptus. Excuse me, that's not the Texas Receptus. I grabbed the wrong one. That's uh, actually the Jehovah's Witness one. Nestle's 25th edition. Excuse me. Not like there's, you know... Both, both about as useless in my opinion. But here you have the Texas Receptus. I'll take my Texas Receptus and I'll go out and I'll witness to people and things. And I'll preach out of this book here. I'd be a fool to do that. You're not going to make any kind of spiritual progress preaching out of this thing. It's a waste of time. It's certainly not out of the Nestle's text up, up there either. Nestle's 27th and 28th. Then I have a 25th edition. Don't really feel a need for the 26th edition right now. So... But, you know, the whole point is, this book works for Bible-believing Christians because we believe it. Can you say that as a Roman Catholic? Well, I believe the traditions of the church and things like this and the teachings of the, the church and, and whatnot. I have, I have my catechism here, you know, and um, as long as I have my catechism, I can interpret sacred scripture, okay? But what, when the cate what about when the catechism contradicts sacred scripture? You go with this? What about when they change this? What about uh, when they come out with uh, new councils? Like Vatican II. What do you do then? Um, well, you see, the teachings of the church that were there for um, over a thousand years, uh, well, uh, we've kind of had to kind of redo some of that. And, and um, uh, uh, a what? The unshakable rock of Peter the church. And yet it changes all the time. Contradicts. 
You better come out of Catholicism. Turn next to 2 Thessalonians. You better start believing the book that you hold in your hands. I mean, it's such a simple standard. I mean, again, let's talk logic here for a minute. Bible-believing Christians are logical, all right? Um, when I say this is God's Word, that means I believe it's perfect and does not need to be changed. Why? Because it's God's Word. Do you understand that? God's Word. If God wrote the book, if, that's, if my profession is that this is God's Word, then I don't dare change it. I accept it as my authority, as my standard. And anybody comes along and they say, um, actually, you know, I want to do such and such. You know, I, I believe in pleading the blood on such and, you know, on this whatever thing. And I go, okay, pleading the blood. Let's see. Uh, excuse me. I'm not finding the words pleading the blood in here. Okay. Um, can you give me the concept of this? I mean, can you give me some scripture on that? Well, no, there isn't any. Oh, okay, then I reject what you say. That's logical. But let's continue here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked Catholics. Oh, excuse me. Wicked men. <clears throat> for all men have not faith. Again, how interesting is it that it kicks Roman Catholicism again? All men have not faith. Do you have faith as a Roman Catholic? Or is your belief system based on sight? We have the Holy Catholic Church. We have St. Peter's Basilica. We have a visible head in the Pope. We have all the biggest church buildings in the local towns. You go into your uh, big local cathedral. Um, is it just kind of simple, plain, basic uh, place there? No, no. Elaborate statues, gold, marble floors. Why? Because for all men have not faith. Unreasonable and wicked men. You know what uh, Roman Catholics are? They're unreasonable and wicked men. And you see, what brings freedom, what bring, brought freedom to Bible-believing Christians... Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. The freedom that we've had here in America has been because Christians have been allowed to print this book. And this is the book right here that brought freedom to this country. It's the King James Bible. That's the one. And be glorified. You understand? You say, oh, that's, that, that's, that's the manifest word. It's a manifest word. It can't be the written word. There's none of this stuff is about the written word. Oh, we're going to see about that here in just a little bit. Let's go to the next reference, Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to see about this thing of it not being the written word because I know that's another little tactic that's played. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Who's it talking about there? Who's the him? The word of God in context. This book has personality. It's a living book. It's not a dead book. It's not a dead book of traditions like the Catholics have. It's a living book. It's been well said, the King James Bible is the only book that has the author present every time you open it up, no matter where you are. The Holy Spirit will come and He'll guide you into all truth, and this book is the truth. I can tell you that say, well, this, this is ridiculous. Why? Do you ever ask yourself that? Why is it ridiculous to be a Bible-believing Christian? Is it ridiculous that I have a standard that I can hold in my hands and say, I'm not going to change it. It changes me. That's ridiculous. 
I guess I'd be better off going to some big church someplace with a guy that's a sinner telling me what to do and saying, never mind what the Bible says, listen to me instead. Got a weird system there, Roman Catholics. But you say you still didn't prove that it's written. It's, it's the manifest word. It's not the written word. We're not supposed to change. You know, I mean, okay, how could you, you know, if it is the manifest word that it's all these scripture references we've gone over, um, how could you add to or subtract from Jesus Christ? How could you mess with him? No, it's the written word. Let me prove it. First John chapter 5, beginning in verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, I've said some real hard things against the Roman Catholics out there, and things, and probably most of you shut it off already, you know. But if you've come this far, um, this is really what the whole issue is. I can show you written scriptures, written promises that tell you that you can know that you have eternal life. Now, let me just get real personal here for a minute. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Well, we can reasonably assume because, you know, if I'm a faithful Catholic and I die in a state of grace, I, I didn't say that. There's no, if you die in a state of grace, it says you can know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? I do. You say, well, that's just your interpretation. Okay, how do I interpret it differently? How do I interpret it differently? I mean, why on earth would God give us a book if we can't know that it's the truth? Huh? I mean, wouldn't you judge me if I came out and I messed with this book? And I started coming out and saying, you know, I, I think that uh, God told me I should have uh, at least 30 or 40 wives and I need to be making at least $20 million a year and and, um, you know, what? It, you'd judge me, wouldn't you? And you'd have good sense for doing it. Then why am I wrong for judging your Pope and your system for doing things that don't appear in this book? Who's logical again? You see, I care about you. It might not sound like it. it might be, you know, oh, I'm very offended and everything else. But uh, I care about you. And so do my brothers and sisters in Christ out there that witness to you. We don't want you to go to hell when you die. We can show you scriptures, 1 John 5, 10 through 13, that say that you can know that you have eternal life because we have a record, a written record. The words that I speak, the same shall judge him in the last day. Jesus Christ said in John 12, 48. You better get it straightened out. So, uh, to the Catholic there that wrote the comment saying, um, what proof do you have? What proof do you have that the Bible alone is to be our final authority? Uh, well, there you go. There it is. Uh, now I've answered your question. So now provide down there in the comment section so all the world can see it. I mean, you can put your own video out there and whatever else and things, and we could go to some public forum or something like this and have some kind of debate, which would be a total waste of time. Um, I'm not about to do that. It's a waste of time. I mean, why should I? Just put a couple of scriptures down there in the comment section. Some scriptures you said you can prove from the Bible alone that, that Peter was the Bishop of Rome. Uh, just one verse, two verses, three verses, ten, as many as you can provide, please. Uh, show me where Peter was a Pope, the Bishop of Rome, whatever. Show it to me. You can't. You can't. You better repent of your Roman Catholic beliefs. You better come out of that system. You better understand that 
this whole papal system has no basis in Scripture. It is a satanic counterfeit of true Christianity. They even make satanic, satanic counterfeits of, their, uh, of the Bible. Here's the real one right here. Here's the fake one. It's funny because I've shared this in other videos. I'll just show it one more time. It's kind of funny because right there, they even have the uh, all-seeing eye. Well-known occult symbol, and they call it Lord. Right in the uh, St. Joseph edition here of the uh, New American Bible. You better get out of that system. That is going to be it. Thank you for watching.